Do you uh, ever find yourself thinking about how much the world has changed just in your short lifetime? Back when I was a kid, if you had told us that someday during my lifetime, we would all be carrying around in our pockets a wireless telephone that would enable us to call anyone, anywhere, at any time throughout the world. In the little hometown I grew up in, Acton, Indiana, we would have said, have you been smoking that marijuana weed? <laughs> You're crazy. It'll never happen. Because back then, life was rather primitive. We had phones, of course, but they were landlines, hardwired. Most homes had a phone attached to the wall somewhere in the house, which means when you went to work or when you were out and about, you had to be away from your phone and out of communication for hours at a time. Not just that, but in most homes back then, certainly the home I grew up in, our phone was what we called a party line. Now you youngins are probably thinking, wow, that sounds like fun, Jeff. What was a party line? <laughs> Believe me, it was no party. A party line is where you shared your landline with several other parties, nearby neighbors, four or five of them, so that you were all on the same line. That means if your neighbor was on the phone, you could not be on the phone. That means if someone was trying to call you while your neighbor was on the phone, they would get a busy signal and you would have to wait until old Miss Schaefer, who had these really long conversations, would finally get off the phone before you could use the phone. Not just that, but if you were really careful and picked the phone up very quietly, <laughs> you could listen in to all your neighbor's private business <laughs> and they had no idea you had done it. <laughs> I never did it, I swear, my sisters, oh, my sisters. <laughs> it was a different world back then, and oh, how much things have changed. As Bob Dylan said, the times, they're a-changing. And that is what Jesus wants to talk to us about today. The illusion of permanence, the inevitability of change, and at some point, ultimate change. Today, we are concluding our sermon series on the parables of Jesus, eight critical life lessons. Next week, we'll start a new sermon series where we explore the nuts and bolts of what it looks like to live by faith. The Bible says, live by faith. Okay at an operational level in our lives, what does that look like? But for today, we're concluding our sermon series on parables by looking at parable number eight and critical life lesson number eight, which is about the illusion of permanence in life. Let's start with a prayer. Jesus, life has a way of lulling us to sleep hypnotizing us into thinking that what is now is what will always be. Wake us up today. Reset our expectations of what's to come so that we can live in the light of that truth. We ask in your holy name. Amen. So Jesus begins today's story with these words, Matthew 25, 1. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five of them were wise. Historians tell us that one of the high points of ancient Jewish weddings was when the groom would arrive at the home of the bride to take the bride ceremonially with him to their new home together. So the bridesmaids and the attendants and all of the wedding guests would gather outside the home of the bride with great 
expectation waiting for the groom to arrive. When the groom would finally arrive, the bride would come out of the house and they would put her up on a litter and ceremonially carry her from her home to her new home with her new husband. And all the bridesmaids and attendants and guests would march in celebratory procession. And if it was after dark, they would carry torchlights with them. So it would be a torchlight procession. So Jesus tells us that these 10 uh, 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 what's the word? These ten bridesmaids were, sorry, were gathering together at this wedding in great anticipation. In fact, they were so ready, they were so with it, that their torches were already lit. But the groom somehow gets delayed. I mean, not just a little bit delayed, but hours start to pass. The night gets later. And later, before long, bridesmaids, attendants, and guests are starting to drift off to sleep. When along around midnight, someone shouts out, wake up, everybody. The groom is coming. Wake up. The bridesmaids wake up only to realize that their torches have gone out while they were asleep. But five of these bridesmaids had come to the wedding planning for the unexpected. So they had flasks of oil, were able to douse their torches with fresh oil and relight them on the spot. But five other of the bridesmaids had not anticipated the unexpected. They had no extra oil with them, so they had to leave and go into the village and, and hope to find somebody who would sell them some oil at this very late hour. And while they are away looking for oil, the groom arrives, the procession begins, and they get left behind. Jesus sums it up this way, verse 10, while they went to buy more oil, these five foolish bridemaids, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. These five foolish bridemaids missed a momentous moment. They missed the once in a lifetime opportunity to celebrate the wedding of their dear friend, the bride. Then Jesus ends the story with these words, verse 13, keep awake therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Whoa, hold on there, Jesus, just a minute. What day? What hour? The groom in this story represents Jesus. So this is a story about what we call the second coming of Jesus. The idea that someday, when we least expect it, Jesus will return and usher in an entire new reality, a completely new era in human history. Earth as we have known it, life as we have known it, will be no longer. A whole new age will be upon us, and nothing will ever be the same again. And ever since Jesus promised his return, People have been assiduously studying all the biblical prophecies about the end times in order to try to pinpoint precisely when will it happen and how will it happen. For example, back in the early 1800s, there was a man named William Miller who had immersed himself in the study of the biblical end times prophecies in order to try to figure it all out. And he came up with a very compelling theory of the case. He focused in particular on Daniel chapter 7 and verse, or Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, where Daniel prophesied that shortly before the end of the age, the temple in Jerusalem would be restored 2,300 days before the end of times. The restoration of the temple was associated with the end of the age. Miller also pointed out that the Hebrew word for day can also mean year. It's a flexible term. And so Miller's theory is that Daniel was not talking about 2,300 days, but 2,300. 
300 years. Miller estimated that Daniel uttered this prophecy somewhere around 457 BC. So 457 BC plus 2,300 years gives you the year 1843. And so that led Miller to conclude that Jesus was going to return in 1843. In 1831, he published a book that laid out all of his theories and all of the case for this being the end of times. That means people had 12 years now to get ready. His book was a sensation. Thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in the United States at the time read his book. Many became persuaded. In fact, by the year 1843, he had even pinpointed the date of the year that he thought it was going to happen. And historians tell us that about 50,000 of his followers gathered on that day so that they would be together when the great moment came. Beyond that, hundreds of thousands of people who had read his book and were influenced by it were sitting with bated breath wondering, is this going to be the day? But that day came and went. And no Jesus. From time immemorial, people have been trying to figure out, when will it happen? How will it happen? I grew up in a church like that, a church where we were obsessed with biblical prophecy. We were part of a church movement that thought we too had figured out when the end was going to be. We focused in particular on, a, on something that Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus talks about the restoration of the people of God, the restoration of Israel, and indicates that when you see this happening, the restoration of Israel, not more than a generation will pass before the end comes. And so we reasoned in the church that I was raised in, we noted that after World War II in 1948, Israel was reestablished. And we estimated that in the Bible, a generation is about 30 years. So 1948 plus 30 years would give you 1978. We were convinced that Jesus was going to return on or before 1978. As a young teenager growing up in the early 1970s, I was absolutely convinced that my life here on earth was going to be short because Jesus was coming back before 1978. In fact, I literally remember thinking to myself, darn it, I'm never going to get to learn to drive a car because Jesus is going to come back before I can get my learner's permit and learn to, you know, Jesus, could you please hold off just a little bit so I at least get to drive a car? And apparently my prayers were incredibly powerful because 1978 came and went and no Jesus. In fact, we're still waiting to this very day. Maybe I prayed a little bit too much. <laughs> and with that, I learned at a very visceral level. Don't make the mistake of thinking you've got it all figured out. Nobody is going to ever figure it all out. I mean, that doesn't stop us from trying and having all kinds of different theories. Devout believers throughout the ages and in our time have looked at the exact same prophecies and come to very different interpretations of what it's predicting. For example, many Christians believe that someday Jesus will suddenly appear in the sky in a, in a dramatic fashion and will touch down on earth, not unlike an alien spacecraft landing on earth. A quick, dramatic, immediate moment. Meanwhile, other Christians equally devoted to the scriptures and the prophecies read those same prophecies and they have concluded that actually, no, it's, it's going to happen gradually, almost in evolutionary fashion over the course of time as, as the gospel spreads and, and, and more and more people embrace it and the earth gets better and better and finally we will be ready for Jesus. Some Christians read these prophecies and, and see Jesus directly ruling here on earth when he returns. Others read those same prophecies and conclude that Jesus will rule indirectly through his people when the earth is filled with the goodness of the gospel. Some people read those prophecies and conclude that there will be a cataclysmic times that lead to the end of the age, compelling Jesus to come back. Others read those same prophecies and conclude that things are going to get better and better and better until we're finally ready, and then Jesus comes back. They're all reading the same prophecies, interpreting them with earnestness and sincerity, looking at each other thinking, you get that out of that, you get that out of that. 
And there's nothing wrong with trying to figure it out. But we're never going to successfully do it. How can I be so sure? Because Jesus himself tells us that. Look again at the last thing that he said in today's scripture passage. I'm sorry. I'm... Let me get there. There we go. In Matthew 25, 13, very end of our passage, Jesus says, keep awake, therefore, for you know what? Neither the day nor the hour. Jesus, the, in the chapter before that, says it even more emphatically. Matthew 24, 36. About that day and that hour, no one knows when or how. Neither the angels in heaven, nor even the Son. Jesus, while he was here on earth, didn't know. But only the Father in heaven. What part of you you ain't going to be able to figure out, don't we understand? And yet we keep trying. Two good old boys, a couple farmers, were standing out beside a rural roadway one day, holding up a homemade sign that said, Turn around before it's too late. The end is near. Now, there weren't many vehicles that passed on this roadway, but before long, a woman comes tootling along in a convertible, beautiful summer's day, sees this sign these two farmers are holding, and as she whisks past them, shouts, leave us alone, you religious nuts. She rounds the bin, keeps going, and they hear a big splash. The one farmer grins at his friend and says, you think maybe instead we should just make a sign that says, bridge out ahead. turn around, the end is near, you get the idea. People have been predicting the end to the point that a lot of people turn them off. What if we just heeded what Jesus said? You're not going to be able to figure it out. But Jeff, if Jesus knew we weren't going to figure it out, why did he bother to tell us about it? And why did he give us all these signs to watch for? He tells us so that we will keep awake. You see, the purpose for all these prophecies is not so we'll figure them out and get to map it out. The purpose for all these prophecies is so that we will live as woke people, so to speak, spiritually woke people, so that we will live with a keen awareness that the current reality that surrounds us, as permanent as it seems, is someday going to give way sooner or later, whether it's upon our death or Jesus' return, whichever happens first, someday this reality is going to give way to a whole new, greater reality. I love the way Hebrews 13, 14 sums it up. We have here on earth no continuing city, but we look for a city to come. Jesus, in this parable today, at its most basic level, is calling us to embrace an eternal perspective on life. But that's not easy for us to do because it's hard for us to comprehend eternity. After all, what we know now, life as we know it now, is all we've ever known. It's hard to imagine something you've never experienced before. That would be like us saying to people back in the 1960s, someday people are going to be walking around with a wireless communication device in their pocket and be able to talk to anybody anywhere in the world. You, you, you couldn't have imagined in the 60s that that could happen or how that would change the reality as we know it. It's the same way when we finite human creatures who have only known this temporary world are told that there is an eternity a whole different level of reality that's going to someday break in to this earthly life and change it forever. That's hard. To, it's so easy to fall asleep. It's so easy to invest ourselves in the illusion of permanence. That's why a couple weeks ago, Larry Havilon, many of you know uh, Larry Havilon, he, he comes to the early worship service, but Larry, 
he's been a member of our congregation forever, and he's the longtime leader of our Thursday night oasis. In fact, he's the longest, he's led an oasis group in our church longer than anybody ever has by far. 15 years, talk about faithfulness, leading the Thursday oasis. But in any event, Larry came up to me a few weeks ago and said, Jeff, I think it's about time you pulled your string back out. Larry was referring to an illustration that I intentionally repeat every five to seven years here at Life Journey to remind us of the most important, the most basic point that Jesus is trying to make in today's parable. And so when, when Larry speaks, I listen. When Larry says jump, I say how high. So I brought my string with me today, and here I go again, and if you have any complaints, talk to Larry. He's the one that made me do it. Here's the illustration that I like to give every five to seven years. And by the way, I'm going to need a volunteer to help me to hold the other end of this string. Who will be my volunteer? Is anybody willing? I promise. There we go. I promise this is not like that bad old joke that your uncle used to do, right? Amy, pull this over to the wall. Remember when your uncle would say, pull my finger? We're not going to do that, so don't worry about that, all right? Stand there by the door. Okay, now will someone prop that door open for Amy? Just prop it open. There's a kickstand at the bottom of the door. There you go. There you go. Thank you, India. Okay, Amy, I want you to go out into the social hall, and I want you to keep going. Keep going until I say stop. All right, it's been nice knowing you. Further, further further, go up the steps, keep going, up the steps, do, do what I tell you, all right, all right, stop, let's pull it taunt, Amy is all the way to the usher's table out there, hold it for a second, Amy, as I talk, this string is the timeline of your existence, all right, some of you are 20 years old, some are 40, some are 60, some are 80. Do I hear 90? If, <laughs> if you were to plot where you are in your existence on this timeline, in your mind's eye, where would you put yourself? If you're 20, you might say, oh, I'm about over there where Laura is in that, near that first row. If you're 40, you might say, I'm at the door. If you're 60, maybe you're out there where Amy is. If you're 80, maybe you're in the parking lot, right? You're alone. Where in your mind's eye, as you think about your existence, do you tend to plot yourself? The Bible teaches that you are an eternal being, that you will live forever. So if this string represents the timeline of your existence, even if you're 80 years old now, like Tommy is, even he, he looks young, but he's real. Even if you're 80 years old, you are here. Somewhere, if we're drawing it to scale, you're somewhere in that first inch, let's say, of your eternal existence, your entire life here on earth. And when we begin to think of it that way, eternity, it starts to change our whole perspective and life starts to make a whole lot more sense thanks Amy you can you can set it down now we'll roll it up after service be careful as you exit don't trip over your eternal life there as you come to the front and Amy as you come back through you can just close that door if you will what I want us to carry away from this is the understanding that as substantial as this life feels here on earth. This is just a temporary preparatory prelude to all of eternity. And when you start to see it that way, a lot of things make a whole lot more sense. We have here no continuing city, but we look for a city that is to come. This is critical life lesson number eight that Jesus wants to teach us. Don't 
be deceived by the illusion of permanence. No matter how permanent this present reality may seem, it is going to give way to a whole new eternal reality when Jesus returns or when you die, whichever happens first. And by the way, what Jesus is teaching us today about our earthly life vis-a-vis -vis our eternal life, the same principle also applies to the various seasons of our earthly life. Whatever season in life you find yourself in right now, good or bad, it's going to change. It's not going to last forever. Don't be deceived by the illusion of permanence. So, if that's the basic point that Jesus is trying to teach us in today's parable, what are the takeaways? How should that affect how we live this week and this month and this year. I see two key takeaways. Takeaway number one, be sure to savor the beauty of what is right now because it won't last long. Whether you're talking about this earthly life or a particular season in this earthly life, there's going to be beauty in it. Savor it because it won't last long. Before you know it, it will be gone. A 72-year-old man named Randy Long was cleaning out his garage one day when he stumbled across a bucket of old baseballs that he used to toss back and forth with his son and then his grandson. But the years had passed, of course, and he no longer had any particular need for this bucket of old baseballs, but he didn't want to just throw them away because they had sentimental value. That's when he got an idea. He took the bucket of old baseballs to a local batting range, put it down next to the batting range, hoping someone would find it, and left a note for the person who found it, and this is what he wrote in the note. I hope someone can use these baseballs. I found them cleaning my garage. I pitched them to my son and my grandson for countless rounds. My son is now 46 years old. My grandson is 23. They've both moved away. I'm 72. And what I wouldn't give to pitch a couple more buckets of baseballs to my boys again. If you're a young father, cherish these times. You won't believe how quickly they'll be gone. God bless. P.S. Give them a hug and tell them you love them every chance you get. To everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season. Turn, turn, turn. And a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant, a time to reap. A time to laugh and a time to weep. That's the theme song that we played at my mother's funeral here in this sanctuary a couple years ago. I always knew in my life, theoretically, there'll come a time when mom will be gone. But it's hard to really comprehend a reality that you've never experienced before. Theory is different from experience. And so when one day, in the twinkling of an eye, mom is gone. Wow. What I wouldn't give for one more hour on the veranda of that outdoor restaurant in Vail, Colorado, where we sat one day, a bright, warm summer's day, a babbling mountain brook passing beside us, and we talked about life and memories and what the future might hold, what I wouldn't give for one more hour. There's beauty in every season of life, but it won't last. So savor it while you can. That's takeaway number one. Takeaway number two is like it, except in reverse. Takeaway number two is 
push through whatever hardship you're facing right now because it won't last long either. Life itself is full of struggles and hardship and each season of life has its own unique struggles and hardships. When you're in the midst of that hardship, it can be all consuming. It'll feel like this is never going to end. It'll end sooner than you realize. Just wait. If you were uh, uh, into sports when you were a kid, you know what bleacher laps are, right? Bleacher laps or where you run up the steps of the gymnasium to the very top or the stadium to the very top and then back down again and then back up again and then back down again. At the end of a long, hard practice when you were already dog-tired, the coach would say to you, okay, let's do some bleacher laps. And you'd start running up and down and up and down. And before long, your lungs would be on fire. Your legs would be on fire. Your heart would feel like it was going to burst. And just then the coach would say, okay, now take it two steps at a time. Leap two steps at a time. And just when you thought it couldn't get worse, it gets even worse. Keep going, keep going. If you've ever run bleacher laps, you know it's pure torture. So why would anybody ever run bleacher laps? Viewed in isolation, they are senseless torture. So why do we do it? Because we know that those bleacher laps are building endurance into us so that we can shine when we get to the big game. So that the bleacher laps, as painful as they are, they're worth it. Because they're preparing us to shine in the big game. Bleacher laps make no sense when you view them in isolation, but when you draw back and you see the big picture, Boom, all of a sudden they make sense. It's the same way with this earthly life. There's going to be a lot of suffering and hardship in this earthly life. And if this is all we had, it would make no sense. It would seem like pointless torture. But when we draw back and remind ourselves that this is just a temporary preparatory prelude for our eternal existence, and when we realize that these hardships and these difficulties are what are building into us an endurance that's going to allow us to shine for all of eternity. All of a sudden, that which made no sense, that which seemed senseless, now suddenly makes all the sense in the world. The Bible puts it this way. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. So, because of this, we do not lose heart. For this slight momentary affliction, life on earth, is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what can be seen here on earth, but at what cannot be seen, eternity. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. Or as the old hymn, old hymn says, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. When we put the suffering of this life in the light of eternity, ah, it starts to make sense. Are you familiar with the name Mort Kondraki? Mort Kondraki, a, <clears throat> am I losing my mic? Was a well-known political commentator back in the 1990s and the early 2000s. He appeared regularly on the uh, PBS show, The McLaughlin Group, where four different commentators from uh, across the spectrum of political thought, conservative to liberal, would sit down and debate convivially the great issues of the day. That was back when liberals and conservatives could have a sane conversation and be friends and not be angry with each other. So it was a great show. I used to watch it uh, on, a, on a regular basis. Anyway, Mort Kondraki tells about a time when his life, by the way, he's 80 now, but he tells about a time in his life when suddenly in the twinkling of an eye, reality as he knew it changed. One day, his wife Millie was sitting at the kitchen table writing out a check when she said, Mort, something's wrong. I can't make a K. He walked over, looked at the check she was writing, and said, your K looks normal to me. No, she says, something's wrong. Not long after that, she noticed that the little finger on her right hand would sometimes twitch uncontrollably. And that sometimes her foot on the brake pedal in the car would wobble. 
She went to the doctor. Tests were run. When the test results came back, she was back to see the doctor. I guess this was an old school doctor because he didn't just come out and say, this is your diagnosis. Instead, he said, here, Millie, I've got a prescription for you. I think this will alleviate your symptoms. She goes home and she starts to research. What is this medicine? What is it for? The medicine is Symmetral. She's alarmed. She calls Mort at work. Mort, she says, come home right away. Something terrible has happened. He's thinking all the while that maybe one of their kids has been in a car accident. He races home. He says, I've never seen Millie so distraught or so hysterical. Walked into the house, walked into her bedroom. There she stood holding that bottle of Symmetral. And she stand, and as she stands there, she looks at me and she says, Mort, this is Parkinson's medicine. I can't have Parkinson's. I've seen what it does. She was a counselor in a neurology center. It's a horrible disease, Mort. I won't be able to talk. I won't be able to walk. I won't be able to swallow. I won't be able to eat. At some point, you're going to have to take me to the bathroom. I'll be totally dependent. You won't love me anymore. You'll want to leave me. Mort tried to reassure her. I'll be with you through this. We'll make it through. And he was. He was with her through the whole ordeal until she passed away in 2000 four, walking side by side with her. During that time, somebody once asked Mort Kondraki, how are you doing it? He said, I just ask God to help me every day, multiple times a day. I couldn't do this without God's help. I, I simply couldn't do this without feeling that I was somehow doing God's work in a small way. I've asked God countless times, what's my purpose here on earth? hoping that God will add some new grandiose dimension to all of this. But he never does. The message always comes back to me the same. Your job now is to take care of Millie. And that's what he did. It was painful. It was bitter. Talk about bleacher laps. But in the very process, his eternal soul was being stretched and grown and refined in ways that will that cause him to be a more beautiful soul now and throughout all of eternity his bleacher laps building into him endurance that would allow him and Millie to shine for the big game so to speak when we step back and we look at the big picture that which is senseless starts to make a whole lot more sense. So, to sum it up, live fully in the moment, but always be ready for what's next. Right now in my life, that point is being driven home powerfully. This past February, talk about life changing in the twinkling of an eye. This last February, I got a call from my sister Melody saying, Jeff, dad's been in a car accident. Now, thankfully, it was just a fender bender and nobody was hurt. But in the process, she said, I discovered that dad's driver's license has expired. As soon as, she, as soon as she said that, my heart sank because I knew what that meant. Dad suffers from macular degeneration. His eyesight has been slowly deteriorating. And I knew in that moment, oh no, his driving days are over. There's no way he can pass a vision test and continue driving. We tried everything because He's 90, but he's determined to still drive. So we went to specialists to see, is there anything we can do? Does he have the right lenses? We went to the macular degeneration doctor, give him some more shots in his eye. We went to specialists to see if bioptic lenses would work for him in driving. No, 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 no. Talk about the end of one season of life and the beginning of another. He can't live on his own anymore without transportation. So... He's going to sell his house, and we're going to sell our house, and we're building a house together, a one-level house together where his living quarters will be integrated with ours so that we can be together. And I have no idea how this is going to work because he's not easy to live with, and I'm not easy to live with. For starters, Dad prefers a pet-free house <laughs> but our house is a veritable petting zoo right two cats 
two dogs. How is this going? When Gordon Miner meets David's mischievous cat, Miss Pee Pee, it's going to be like George Foreman and Muhammad Ali. Who is going to win this battle, right? Oh my goodness. Talk about the times a changing. And not just that. We've lived in our house for 27 years. We had that house built. There are so many memories there. It's home. And I always thought in the back of my mind that we would live there at least until we retired. But now suddenly, in the twinkling of an eye, something happens that interrupts those plans. And all of a sudden, we're having to sell the house much sooner than I ever thought. I found myself the other day mowing the front yard. I love to mow. And thinking to myself, at most, I'm going to get to mow this yard maybe eight more times. I better savor it while I can. The place we're moving into, they mow the yard for you. Who ever heard of that? <laughs> God help me. I don't, I'll have to go find, I'll mow the church yard then. I don't, I'm going to have to find something. To <laughs> Sign me up. Sign me. I found myself, this may sound silly, looking at the big cottonwood tree across the road from us and saying, I'm so grateful for you. And looking at a sycamore tree that's doubled in size since we've lived there and saying, thank you for blessing me with you. And getting all sentimental. I don't want to change. But we don't have a choice. Dad needs us. All things flow. Seasons come. Seasons go. Down here on earth, nothing lasts forever. But this much I also know. We are moving into a new season in life that is going to be profoundly meaningful. And so I'm going to savor the beautiful part and I'm going to push through the hard part knowing that even this new season in life is going to be over before we know it. But that's okay because it's all leading somewhere to something greater to an eternal weight of glory that is beyond all measure. So yes, live fully in the moment, save your life, but always be ready for what's next. Travel light, keep your bags packed. Don't invest in the illusion of permanence. As Jesus said, keep awake. Live in the light of eternity. Be ready for the unexpected. This is the wisdom of Jesus. Amen.